Um, thank you everyone for joining us um, in time for today's morning workshop. Good morning to everyone. And just before we begin, I'd love if we could all join together in an, in an acknowledgement to country. So on behalf of our team here at Hallard, Sarah and Karim who will be joining us and all of the other examiners who will be joining us today. Um, I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we are working and um, live here in Melbourne. And for us in Melbourne, that is the Wurundjeri um, people of the Kulin Nations. And I acknowledge their connection to the land um, and pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. Thank you so much for um, joining with me in that, um, as we acknowledge it's a really important part of our culture to uphold. So today we are doing uh, the MMI Master Skills Workshop 2.0 and it's 2.0 because we've done the first one back in July and if you missed that, um, I would highly suggest you watching that as a recording on either our YouTube or our Facebook um, and that will give you a lot of context as um, going forward to today's one because we'll go through some different things um, and Sarah will go through that in a little bit. Um, and for all of our events moving forward, we have a goal for ourselves at Hallard and that is to make sure that we finish on time and so that is something that we are going to try and achieve for you guys today as well. Um, if you have any questions, queries, comments or anything at any point, open the chat now. Um, and use that function because we are always manning the chat and making sure your questions get answered um, if one of us are talking at any point. So I guess before we get started, first things first, in case you have not been to one of our events or know a little bit about Hallard, um, just a quick rundown a bit about us. We are actually a non-for-profit in Australia where we run really affordable GAMSAT and med interview tuition services. Um, and what we do with those tuition fees is use them to um, provide free health education in, in our partner communities in rural Philippines, um, where some of these schools may not receive a proper health education otherwise. And so really excited to be able to now do that with our med interview course as well. Second thing second, I guess the reason why we do this, and um, I just saw Jade's comment come through in the chat, um, was, you know, truly we just do this because we want to see you guys succeed and create all these resources so that you guys have the best chance possible to achieve your dreams, just like all of our examiners have um, previously. And there's just nothing more satisfying to all of us than seeing um, things like this happen where you get incredible scores or you get into the first pick preference that you wanted. Um, and that is all we are trying to achieve for you today and I think what will come through in the next few hours is that for all of our examiners who are here that is their main goal um, just to help you on your journey and so milk the most out of the team that we have I only have Sarah and Karim up here but there will be 13 other examiners joining us in the last hour to run your live MMIs in breakout rooms um, so just a quick intro to Sarah if you have not met Sarah yet which is very unlikely at this point um, Sarah is our head of GAMSAT and also leads our MMI team and she's also an MD3 at Monash um, and as you probably know now, you know, there's probably no one who would want to get you more into med than Sarah does. And even after you do get in, she's probably going to recruit you to be part of her, you know, med friends who do all these other cool um, and also Karim will be joining us um, halfway through and joining Sarah in running an acting station and, and showing that to you guys because that seems to be the most daunting um, or the one that's been reported to be the most daunting uh, station to try. And Karim is one of our section um, three tutors for our GAMSAT stuff, um, but also um, one of our examiners for our med interview stuff and an MD1 at Uni Mel. So I guess before we start, something that I always want to reinforce when you think about how you might want to respond in particularly the last hour, um, sorry, with you guys having a good go at the live um, MMIs is the just philosophy that we have of being authentic to what you truly believe in. We will never spoon feed you a response and our examiners will never tell you what to say and what not to. They will only give you thoughtful things and points to consider to maybe add value to what you truly believe in. And that's what you'll receive in sort of the last um, hour or so. And as much as, you know, the med interviews do matter and, and conveying the right sort of points do matter, being authentic to who you are and what you believe in matters so much more because these med interviews are just one data point your whole med journey is the whole you know um end goal 
And so for the structure for today, Sarah is going to take you through for the first, I think, 40 minutes through a concept of having a structured response does not equal having a re rehearsed response. And so Sarah is going to go through a few different structures that you could use and um, want you to really reflect on those points that she gives you in that time because you'll put that straight into practice in the last hour. So then you'll have a little bit of a break where Sarah and Karim will sh demonstrate us acting um, station with you. And then um, we'll have our 13 examiners come on board and I might just introduce them at the end when they're all here. Um, so they'll all go into different breakout rooms and you might have three or four students in each breakout room and you'll all have a go at have doing two live MMI stations. And in that group, um, probably one or two will have a go at it giving a response and then everyone will be able to provide feedback as, as well as your examiner will provide feedback in that time as well. So just before we get started, there are, we, you know, like I say, we're always happy to do these things and open source them for everyone to get access to a bit of training before their um, MMIs. But I just have two asks to make sure that everything does flow well and everyone is comfortable and this is a great learning space for everyone. And the first ask is just to start getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. And what that means is really just the people who put, actively put themselves in uncomfortable situations are the ones who are going to grow and we want that for all of you. And so when there's an opportunity to be maybe the first one to give a response or have a go at something, yeah, like it's so uncomfortable, but that is an opportunity to grow at all points. And I think everyone will be able to respect that you're just giving it a good crack and no one expects perfection at this point. And the last thing is to speak to others how you would like to be spoken to, especially when we open up forums where, you know, we allow strangers to essentially give feedback here. Everyone here are peers. And so just keep in mind that when you are offering feedback to speak to others, how you would like to be spoken to. And with that, I will hand over the forum to Sarah and she'll get you all started with all that content. Hooray, thanks Liz. So welcome everyone. Now, if you would like to now, I would love for at least a few of you to turn on your cameras just so I feel like I'm not alone, but otherwise you don't have to turn it on until you get to the breakout rooms. Hello, yay. Okay, fantastic, welcome. So today I'm going to run through a few things for the first 40-ish minutes, like Liz mentioned. Now this slide you probably have seen before at some of my other webinars. I'm not actually going to talk to it much. In fact, what I would say is that if you didn't come to our last one, the last MMI one, it's up on our YouTube channel and I go over sort of the mind of the marker, the whole point of MMIs. And I also go over some idea generation and where you can find some content practice and things like that. So yes, if you didn't come, which I say a lot of names and faces from last time so you're probably well aware of that and that's why i wanted to focus on something different today but if you didn't then you can go and find that and also we have a lot of practice now on our podcast which i think we'll go over more at the end and so there'll be some of this stuff on there as well so today instead and i wanted to keep this slide in just as a reminder that the best healthcare professionals which is what they're looking for when they interview you is someone who can show a balance between having the expertise or the ability to deal with the intelligence side and the knowledge side which all of you are showing already through your marks which have qualified to get an interview so your chance with interviews is to more show those soft skills of a doctor and of humanness, empathy and those things. But like I mentioned, I go over this in a lot more detail in the previous masterclass. So you can go and check that out if you weren't able to make it. So today I wanted to talk about structure of responses. So what I'm going to do is give you a few scenarios, a few options, run through some examples, give you some of the do's and don'ts. And then hopefully today, when you have a go at some of the stations, even if you're not the one taking them, you can think about structure in your head and think about how you might present the station. So get comfy. I'm going to talk to you for a bit. You can take notes. You can rewatch this again later if you want to, because I've tried to cram in a fair bit of information. So I'm going to start at the very start. 
It will depend on the uni. They sometimes have different times of how long you get to read the scenario for. But when you read that scenario, you should be actively engaging with it. Now, I don't mind how you actively engage, like it's obviously your med interview, but I would recommend that before you even jump into anything wild and crazy about it, that you check in and go, what do I think about this? And so who knows what you're going to get given in the scenario, but sure enough, there is something that you will know or understand or relate to, and it gets your thinking going, whether it's a personal experience you've had, whether it's an opinion you have whether it's something to do with a family member, I don't know. It really depends on the station. And I'll show you more examples of that as we go through. But basically, the moment you see that station, you should already be thinking about what, like, what connection or relation do I have to this station. The second part here, have an approach to it, is what I'm going to go over. Your approach is likely to vary depending on the station type. In fact, I can almost guarantee that it will. And also your approach will probably be unique to your style. But I guess for me and my job today is to show you some options and then your job is to go away and find out what works for you. So I've come up with a few key structures, spoken to a few other med students to find out what worked for them and compiled some things that will hopefully help set you off in the right direction today. So here's some of the methods, I guess, that I wanted to go over today. And I'll go over them in a lot more detail than just this slide. So I'm not going to just read out the slide for the sake of it. You can all read, I'm sure. So <laughs> the first method is the STAR method. I really like this method because you, it helps you to tell a story in a structured way. So I, and each method, what I've done is put what I think the method's really good for, but you can also adapt it to a lot of things, or you can use different methods as part of a response. A lot of unis, they will give you a set of questions as you do the session. And so you might use a method for answering one of the questions. So for example, this method is great if they ask you, can you tell us about a time that X happened to you or that this happened or that you experienced this? And then you can reflect on that time using this structure. What I find tends to happen is that people get asked or when I'm practicing with someone, I say, can you tell me about a time that this happened to you or can you relate this situation to a personal experience and they panic and they just word vomit and they just tell me all this stuff. So this is a really good structure. So start by stating what the situation is and work your way through. So here's the situation. Here's what I had to do, the task. This is what I did. And this is what, I, what the result was, including things like what the impact was and what you learned. This method is actually used in interview processes in HR all the time. It's what they look for in your structure. So it's a tried and true method. There's nothing fancy about it. It works. It helps because your brain can just remember four steps. So I think the main, I was thinking about this and I thought, you know what, the main benefit is me showing you a bit how to actually do this or how these could happen in real time. So I've put together a few little examples of each one. So my first example for this STAR technique is explain a situation in which you had to make a hard decision. And so if you like, you can think along as you go and maybe think about a situation that you've had and think, you know, how would I do each step and see if it sort of matches the criteria as we go. So I thought about how when I was 18, someone who I was very close to became quite abusive towards me because they were going through emotional things in their personal life. So that's my situation. And so then from that, I had to work out how to deal with the situation so that I could look after myself, but also being wary of them and their needs and what was going on for them. So what did I do? I first, I spoke to them about how it was affecting me and I told them that, yes, I was worried about what was going on for them, but also that I needed to look after myself and that I was going to spend a bit of time thinking about how things were going and then we would readdress it. And we talked a lot and they made promises that they would change. But about a month later when things didn't change, I said, you know what, I need to have healthy boundaries in my life. And that means looking after myself. And unfortunately, this isn't part of that. And so I had to end our 
very long standing friendship and we'd been close for a long time. And when we did that, I said, you know, this doesn't mean that people don't like you. It doesn't mean that you're alone. It just means that this has been really unhealthy for me and I need to grow and look after myself. And so I set them up with some support services and told them, you know, if you need something and need to reach out, you can tell me. But I think it's better that we have these boundaries for now. And this was really hard for me because I obviously still really cared about this person, but I also cared about myself. And what I learned from that was that sometimes how others treat you isn't personal, but that still, even when we give the benefit, people the benefit of the doubt, there is a limit and we need to have healthy boundaries. And I learned the importance of not self-sabotaging myself just for someone else's benefit, no matter how much I care about them. So that was my little hard decision. Hopefully you can see why it was hard and also what the, the outcome was and what the learning was. This is so important for med interviews. I've highlighted a couple of parts I wanted to point out. Uh, first, I'll start from the start. I think the situation's pretty clear. Just say what was happening. And then the T, the task is purely what was the issue? Why was it an issue? Because if you just say the situation, it might not be clear why it was an issue or why people, why you had to make a decision at all. And so spelling that out. And then this part, the action really shows how you deal with the situation. So this one, I think I wanted to put this part in also to show that you can show multiple parts. You don't just have to go, I did, I did this, move on. You can still discuss why you did things, etc why I did it, how I did it, all those good W questions. And then this one is really important. They really want to hear what you learned from your situation. Like, why are you sharing this experience? Is it just a nice experience or did you actually gain something from it? What was the impact of the experience? And so this part here of, I shouldn't have to self-sabotage for someone else's benefit. I wanted to bold this as well, because this is actually just such a nice link in or tie into the things that they're looking for in you when you are applying for medical school. So this is such a great skill for someone to be able to understand how to look after themselves so that they're not going to be in medical school with a very unhealthy relationship with themselves. So with most of these, if not all of these, when they ask you to share an experience or ask you, have you, can you relate to this? You need to show why that's a relevant experience to the whole interview process. And it could just be a one line thing. And I could probably even like push this further and say something like, and now I can trust myself that even if I come across someone who's really difficult, again, I can still set boundaries, which would indicate that if I came across someone, even in my professional career like that, I'm able to do this. So then it's sort of showing that ability. So it doesn't really matter what the scenario is. You can walk through here these steps and stick to being able to actually explain your experience in a really structured way. This is a great one, even if you are doing interviews for other things to have down pat, especially interviews where they fire at you. Have you had this situation? Have you had this situation? Which I'm sure you've all been in before. So next one. <laughs> The next, and also as an FYI, feel free to ask any questions in the chat as we go. I've got um, my chat open, so feel free to do that. So the next one is like a spoken essay or a debate. I know that this one is talked about a lot for med interviews. A lot of people recommend this kind of structure. I think it's a little bit overrated in that there are many other structures you can try and you don't have to stick to this, but it still works and it's still good. It's great if you get asked your opinion on something and particularly if you have a couple of key points and so that you're not scattered, just going through it very similar to an essay or if you've ever done debating, it's more like a debate because you're actually speaking it. And so start, still start by stating what you think. So your overall thought or contention. If you don't know what it is yet, that's okay. Don't worry about it, jump into your points. And then at the end, you can wrap it up with a contention and make it look like you were leading to that all along, even though you're trying to work it out as you went. But ideally you should have a contention from the start. After that, 
you just list your points. I'll give you an example in a second, but you can choose what order you want to list them in, whether it's the most important first or whether it's you build as you go or it builds impact or builds complexity up to you. I would recommend practicing this. And also if you like writing essays and that's something that you're really good at, you'll probably enjoy doing this. Or if you've done debating before, you'll probably enjoy this. And then at the end, wrap it up so that they're not confused and they don't think, oh, they just had a lot of points that they wanted to list. So wrap it up with what you think and why. Just like in a debate or in an essay, you're welcome to give a rebuttal or a counter argument and we'll give the counter argument and then say why you think your side is stronger. So with Caleb's question in the chat, do you have any suggestions if you get a question along the lines of have you ever experienced X and it's something you haven't had to deal with before? I would say with that, the first thing would be preparation prior. With the masterclass I ran about a month ago, I had some sort of idea generation boxes and things that you should consider preparing or knowing what to talk about on the day. Definitely having some personal experiences up your sleeve for each station type would be very beneficial. And so that would be one recommendation. The other thing is if you get there on the day and you genuinely have no clue and can't think of an experience, you can say that and say, you know what, I don't think I have, but here's a similar experience I've had. Or you can say, you know, I don't think I have, but here's how I would respond in this situation. So you can be honest, don't make something up just for the sake of it. Be honest and bring it back to the whole point of the station, which is them getting to know you and getting to understand you. But I would definitely have a few personal experiences. Also, one other thing with that, if they, even if they don't explicitly say, have you ever had this experience? Or if they do and they, it's part of a bigger station, such as let's say that the one I just showed you all with the friendship, that they um, gave me a station and it was about someone being in a difficult friendship. And then towards the end, they were like, okay, so what do you think about this? Or what would you have done? Then you can bring in an example there. I would recommend doing that if you have the time to bring in your own personal example, because it makes you stand out and it shows that you really understand the station, not just superficially understand the station. But yes, if you, if you have had that experience, then you might as well bring it in. Okay, so. So this one, I decided, I just felt like doing a fun one rather than a med related, med interview related topic. I don't know why I just felt like it, but should every Sunday be a public holiday? So firstly, state your contention. So my contention is, and obviously I'm not going to stand there and go, hello, my contention is, they'll probably ask me something like, what do you think about this? And I'm going to say, you know what, I actually do think that Sunday should be a public holiday, but not in the same way that other public holidays are celebrated, like Christmas or Easter. And the reason why I think that is because I think about the society I live in, and it's very capitalist at the moment. And a lot of my friends and a lot of people I know are very familiar with the hustle, which is all about everyone running around, being busier, being more productive. And I really think that we all need to slow down, especially because the more we speed up, the more stressed we become. And I think that this contributes to a lot of mental illness. And this is just becoming really normalized in our society. Everyone just says they're stressed and it's fine. So I think that the hustle is really damaging and we need to counteract that. And I also have been reading a bit about this and studies have shown actually that people who have periods of rest, particularly after things like injury or a long period of working, that when they return after the rest period, they're actually more productive and they're able to focus on the tasks that they resume and have a fresh mind. Personally, for me, I grew up very religious and so I had a Sabbath every Sunday and I still don't do any uni work on Sundays. I never study on Sundays. And I think for me, that actually helps me to practice this because I'm able to re-energize and know that Sunday is my day to not have to work and to just look after myself and rest. And I think that a lot of people have their own version of this, whether it's they do their sport or leisure on Sundays or on a particular day of the week and they put everything else aside, or other people also have their own versions of religious worship where they have a Sabbath. 
And so I do think that it's really important, but I don't think that it should be a public holiday in the way that we celebrate other public holidays and have like a Sunday festivity. It should be that people can spend time with their loved ones or reflect or give themselves what they need rather than running around and being involved in that hustle, which is why I think it shouldn't be compulsory that it's a more traditional public holiday, but I think it's more that we need to have this culture of everyone calming down and it just being really normal to say, you know what, this is my day when I've put aside to relax. And if that's Sunday or any other day, I think our society needs this. Boom, ta-da. That's why Sunday should be a public holiday. So hopefully by the end of that, they're all like nodding and they're like, yeah, cool. She's got it. Or he's got it. They've got it. So contention, what you think, yes, no. I'm going to go over this in a bit as well, but doctors aren't fence sitters. You need to tell them yes, no, not like, oh, maybe, maybe not. Yeah, cool. That's both good. You can say, look, both sides are good, but this is what I, you still need to say, this is what I think. Obviously, I had a couple of personal experiences that I could put in there. I taught, hopefully you saw an abridged star method in there of like how it impacted me, what I learned from it. This is the situation, this is what I learned nicely tucked in there and also I had things that I knew about I actually didn't research any of this I knew it from conversations I'd had with people and things I've looked up in the past you will have the same thing there will be certain topics that you see and you're like yeah I know something about that other things you'll be like I know nothing about that so you'll have less to put in there if you want to look up some things beforehand sure but you definitely don't need to like do research for med interviews it's more bringing what you know and what you understand Okay, so this method is one that my colleague Gabby really loved, the using the W's to your advantage. And I think what's great about this is if you see a, see a scenario and you freak out and you go, oh my goodness, I have no idea what to even do with this, then you can stop and go, okay, let's start with my first W. Who? Who's involved? What's like, who is this? And who's affected? And then what? What is even going on? And then the why or if it's relevant, whens and wheres, you can also do that. And then even if you, if there's a question there and you need to use a how, you can chuck in a how. But I've just kept it simple for today. When you have who's or when you have a scenario, nearly always there will be multiple people affected. There'll usually be one main person or one main community or party and then there'll be a lot of other people who are smaller stakeholders in the scenario and so even though it might be about a vulnerable patient it's important to consider things like their family their friends their loved ones their work consider yourself if you're involved in it consider how it might impact you consider the community so there's lots of people who could be involved they might not ask you to consider all of those but let's say they say well what are the ethical considerations for this scenario which is why I think this one is great for ethics scenarios then you have to think about who's involved who does this affect because it definitely affects more than the individual and that would change your ethical considerations and decisions I also love it for acting stations because often when you have an actor there's a lot going on and so you can ask them questions I'll go over this more when we do the acting station but you can ask them questions like who else is involved or working out who's involved and go, how are they going? Or have you spoken to them about this? Or have you gotten support from this person or this thing? So that's why I think that acting scenarios are great for it as well. Same deal with the what's, having questions. You might not know the answer to all of these. And in fact, I tell this to my GAMSAT students as well. I don't want you sitting there and asking yourself every single one of these questions. It will waste your time, but more having a few that you're like, this question works for me. So practicing and going, you know what, when I ask myself, like prompt myself with what's happening, oh, this is what's happening, then I'm okay. Or if you inherently already know the answer to that, don't stand there and mentally ask yourself that question. If I really love this question, what other information would you need to find out to make a decision? Because you might get asked, you might get given a scenario and then ask, what would you do? And you're like, um, so what you can do is go in there and say, you know what, I actually really need to know if this patient has an advanced care directive because that would really change what I do and then you can say if they did have one I would do this if they didn't have one I would do that so that's just one example um, but pretty much with anything you can say you know what actually what would change my decision 
especially when you're struggling to make one, be like, what would be the factor that would help me make that decision? And you can make that clear. Heaps of other ones as well. I think for most scenarios, you can talk about what support would be good for the situation and in especially ethical ones. And if someone's acting and they're going through something, a great one there as well. And so that's a really good one to think about. And what advice can you give is a good one for acting even the ethics when they're like, what would you do? What advice might you be able to give them? In terms of the whys, I think this helps to add depth to your answer. So if you see a scenario and it helps you to show empathy, if you see the scenario and you're able to understand why the scenario happened in the first place, you might as well put it in your answer. So you can say something like, you know, I've seen this kind of thing before and I think it happens a lot because X, Y, Z. So even with the should Sundays be public holiday one that I showed you, how I mentioned, you know what, I think people are getting too stressed because we have this hustle culture. So that was very much an answer to a why is why are we even considering making Sunday public holiday? Oh, this is why I think it's important. So yet again. <laughs> So this one's a little bit more of a medical one for you and something that you could could be fair game in a med interview would be a question just like this. So do you think that the use of medical marijuana should be legalised? And so the who's to consider, and obviously once you've considered each of these things, so the who's, what's, etc., then you can synthesise it into a nice answer. So for me, I thought about who's involved and the key people I wanted to consider were the people who actually are asking for the treatment, which are people who are in pain. Or if you don't know what it's even used for, you can just say people who are really vulnerable and need medical support. And the other one is doctors who have to make the call or who are prescribing things. And they obviously want to both do the best by their patients and also practice within the scope of the law. And so they would be the people who are most involved in this. And I guess also can put in there the people who are making the decisions about the law and government and the roles that each of us play in voting and helping make decisions, but also our power players who are actually sitting in government seats. And then the what's to consider. So what is even... The point and I think this can be even this is great even if you see instead of medical marijuana what if it was something you'd never heard of before and you see it and you have a freak out and you're like oh my goodness we're gonna ask them about this I have no idea what this is this is a great part where you can be like okay what's the benefit or why are they even like what is the point and then the flip side of benefit or even if it's what's the pros maybe there's not a benefit part to your scenario what are the pros what are the cons? So what are the risks and what are the potential side effects I put in relation to the medical marijuana? And so you're weighing up both sides and you can present it to them kind of on like this silver platter of, you know what, here are the pros, here are the cons, and then I'm going to balance them out for you and let you know which one, how each one would sway my decision. Does the patient have other options or the individual in the scenario? That's another great question. And I thought about, you know, what if we legalised it or didn't legalise it? What message would it give to the community? Do I think it would be good or bad? Do I think it would say that we care about people or do, we, do I think it would say that we don't really care what people put in their bodies? And I can share my opinion on that. They do want to hear your opinion and they're not going to mark you down if your opinion is a bit misguided or a bit wrong. They're not expecting you to be medical professionals. So if you do have an opinion on something, feel free to share it. I'll go over that a little bit more in a minute. And then the why. So why, why am I even being asked about this? And I think everyone can understand that the reason why this is topical is because it's very controversial drug to use. It's a very controversial treatment. Whereas I'm not going to get asked something more on the lines of should someone take Panadol for a headache? Because it's like, well, other than limit liver damage and people can use it for suicide there's not a lot to talk to to it and people have been using Panadol for a very long time and so it's like why why are you even asking about this so it's great to reflect on that and go this is relevant because xyz and then you can sum it all up so when you are done think about and most of these the who what's why's you can think about when you're standing outside the door of the station or on zoom if you're doing them online you can think about prior to even beginning the station and then as you go if they give you more information or ask you a question you can slot in the what's and the why's and then you can talk to them and you're ready to go 
when they but then if they give you a question like what are the key considerations here or what are the implications here or what are the ethical considerations you can actually walk through these as well and then if you are walking through them as you speak give at the end a summary station statement so something like the risks versus the benefits in this case or the pros versus the cons or what you would need to consider to make that decision things like that okay can we bring in an example of a country where it has been legalized and how positive the outcomes have been absolutely just like how i with the public holiday example had um an example that was both personal example and then said you know what I know of heaps of people who do this and who this works for. And I also know about experiences where people have had rest periods and improved afterwards, improved their productivity. If you know something, you might as well say it. And so if you did know about a country and knew about the outcomes and the positives and even things like how the community responded, anything, you're welcome to bring it in. Definitely relevant. You can practice your star technique as you share the <laughs> experience. Okay. And then the last one that I wanted to go over in detail is the zooming in method. I really like this method for scenarios where you have to discuss a lot of different layers of impact. So public health, they're particularly good, but it could be any scenario that's framed in different ways. So start out with something more general and then begin broad and go become narrower. Or you can go the other way around. You can start narrow and go broader. doesn't really matter. But basically considering the layers of people affected or communities affected. So I think this is a really nice one when you have to consider a lot of different types of stakeholders in the scenario. And as always, you can put in a personal experience or example if you have one. And so this one, I wanted to make it nice and relevant to everyone. So a new COVID vaccine has a number needed to treat of two. So that means that it takes two people for one person to get the treatment, to have successful treatment, but it has a number needed to harm of three. So every three people, one of them will be harmed by the vaccine. Do you think the vaccine should be compulsory? Okay, so the global side of it is definitely what you all understand and relate to right now is very much the global impacts of this pandemic and that everyone has been impacted to it by it and that there's death tolls that are you know people hear that people are dying from it and it just has become normal that that's what's happening and that's really sad and that there's lots of other extrinsic components of the global community that have been affected beyond healthcare, including things like the economy and infrastructure and the way that people work and the way that people socialize. And a vaccine will help us to return to normalcy and better stability in that. And everyone's already harmed by it. So maybe a number needed to harm of three is better than number needed to harm of one where everyone's already being harmed. And with that as well, we need everyone to be getting the vaccine for herd immunity because we actually don't know what the herd immunity percentage is for this so it's probably important for everyone to get it and if it's as good as what we've got might be a good idea for everyone for the sake of the whole world but then the local consideration is that actually not every community is equally affected and it's probably better to stratify risk and think about which communities need it most and which communities can wait until a safer vaccine is developed and I don't know that my community currently needs this measure because we've been socially distancing and locked down and our numbers are going down. So I think if people are staying safe and finding other ways to live, why should they put themselves in additional harm just because a vaccine has been made compulsory? And on the same level, uh, on the same grain, individually, not everyone is equally affected. Some people are able to happily work from home and the harm of staying home might be a little bit of stress or feeling a little bit isolated, but that harm might be a lot less than the harm of getting a vaccine that has an unknown harm and harms a lot of people. And so if people are losing their lives from this, I don't think that they should mess around with a vaccine. Instead, it might just be better if they have to wait a little bit longer at home. So I've shown you layers, global, local, individual, but how do you actually wrap it up? So if you get asked what are the considerations of this scenario and you present them and say, you know what, on a large scale, this is what I think. 
and on a smaller scale this is what i think then again you balance it so just like with the pros cons of the one before you balance them out and go so yeah globally it looks really great to have this vaccine but on the individual and even on a community and local level i'm not so sure and there are more smaller factors that need to be considered so until these factors are ironed out and everyone's looked after i don't think it's a good idea or you can say I do think it's a good idea for now and hopefully later or soon in the next few months or down the track, we can have it so that more people are looked after individually and we can cater for people's individual needs rather than having a blanket ruling. And so there you've summed it up or put all the pieces together of all your considerations. You can break things up in whatever way you like. You don't have to break it up this way. This is just an example, but I think it's nice to break things up. If you like, you can break it up into things like economic, political, emotional, healthcare. You can break it up in different categories. It doesn't have to be this kind of systemic approach, but it will also depend on what you're familiar with, what you like talking about, what you find easier to talk about, etc. The only other thing I didn't put in these structures in this structure set are the typical principles of ethics that they like you to know about. If you don't know what they are, there are four of them and go away, look them up, write them down and work out how you can integrate them in your answer. The examiners today will also talk to you about them when you do an ethical scenario, but just for, I guess, completeness sake right now, first one is respect for autonomy. Second one is beneficence or doing good by the patient, the stakeholder, the individual, whoever's in the scenario. Third one is non-maleficence or not causing harm. And the fourth one is justice. So those four, they are often the bedrock of an ethical scenario. And just like with this, where you can run through global, local, individual, or with the Ws where you consider each bit, with those, I would also go through what principle is relevant here. So is it about, so in this case, this would be a beneficence part. So the global part being, you know what, we want people to benefit and be healthy and well. This part is probably more of a non-maleficence. Okay, now I'm more concerned about not hurting people more than is already necessary. I could probably even bring in autonomy into the individual part and say, you know, it's probably better if people can consent because some people might be really happy with how they're living at the moment. In, in my case, in my community, we're still in quarantine and some people might be okay with going on with that for a while longer rather than getting a vaccine. So maybe people should be allowed to opt in. And then that way you're sort of highlighting those principles. So if it's clearly an ethical scenario, or if you get asked the golden question, what are the ethical considerations here? You should definitely be ticking off those principles to help guide your answer. I think the reason why I didn't give one of those slides was also we went over it in the last masterclass a little bit as well. And yes, here is my concluding bit. I don't know why that didn't click earlier. Um, and I think I already mentioned this. So weighing up the risk. And you can also give a suggestion. So just like with the what question from the W's one, how I mentioned, what would you need to help you make a better decision? I thought, you know what, if someone came along with a much better vaccine, it would be much easier for me to say, yes, this should be compulsory and so in this case it I think a better vaccine needs to be developed before we just start jabbing everyone and putting them all in danger and then I've wrapped it all up okay so if you have any questions about the specific structures feel free to put them in the chat what I will say is no one's sitting there with a checklist going oh yes they use this structure very good it's not about that it's more just to show you there are plenty of different ways that you can present the information that's happening in your brain. But as an examiner, I just want to see that your brain is working through it logically. So it doesn't matter how you choose to structure it. That's your call. That's what you're comfortable with. But working out a way that actually makes sense and that actually presents the information that they're asking for. So in terms of more broad things, as you might have noticed with the ones I went through, there was never a scenario where I was just like, oh, you know, it doesn't matter either way, or this way is good, this way is also good. Uh, that's great, 
but that's not going to help you as a doctor. And they really want to see that you're able to make decisions even when they're hard decisions or that you can understand what things to consider to help you make a decision. So really important to at least say something. They're not going to give you scenarios where there's a right answer. There might be some wrong answers. Like if you show that you blatantly don't care about people, obviously that's not a great answer, but they're not going to sit there hoping that you say, yes, Sundays need to be a public holiday or yes, this vaccine needs to be compulsory. They'll be happy for you to go either way. They just want to hear your reasoning and hear that you are able to make a decision because if someone's dying on the bed, they don't want you standing there umming and ahhing and going, I can't make a decision because I only learned how to consider both sides. So pick an option. Don't be a robot. This feeds into the not memorizing. I'm going to show you that in a second. And don't ramble, just answer the question and move on. I also have one other point with that in a second. Feel free to ask for clarifications. This came up last time as well in the smaller groups when we were doing the breakout rooms. But feel free to ask the examiner, what do you mean by that? Or can you repeat that or whatnot? And if they can't tell you, they'll just say, sorry, I can't give you any more information. Or they might be able to. So if you're confused, you can ask. Engage in your own way. I think this is really important and this is the part that leads into not being a robot. So I'll go over that in a second and not rambling as well. But be professional with them, but also be personable. Okay. In terms of, yeah, good question. Could you please explain the way that follow-up questions will work in terms of the time limit? So how the follow-up questions work will vary slightly on the where you are interviewing. So some places they will give you an initial question with the scenario to prompt you and then you go in and it doesn't matter if you only get through that question. Other places you won't get a question with the scenario, you go in and they'll ask you the first question as you start and they'll be shorter, snappier questions and they'll expect you to at least get through a few of them. But there's none of them where they'll expect you to get through every single question or you haven't passed. They more have the questions there to prompt your thinking. And often the questions will be, there'll be a question and then it's like, you'll be able to cover a lot of stuff in that question. And sometimes you've already answered one of the other questions. So then they won't even bother or they'll just go, okay, cool. So definitely within the window, you might get asked a couple of questions. You might not be prepared to have to answer questions, but you might never even get to them. Yeah. In terms of marking criteria, your um, examiners today will go over them a little bit more. So I won't, yeah, I won't do that right now. But if you still are unsure about it after you've done the stations, you can ask, ask the question again and we'll make sure we answer that for you. And then here, this statement practice makes perfect. I just wanted to add in this and what my colleague Gabby likes to say, Practice doesn't necessarily make perfect, perfect practice makes perfect. So whatever you're doing when you practice, make sure you practice well and that you're reflecting and that you're getting good feedback and you're trying to improve rather than just churning through stations just for the sake of practicing, but doing it at really poor quality and standard. And then my sort of add to that is practice doesn't necessarily make perfect, but practice makes permanent. So if you are permanently practicing poorly, then you're going, it's going to stick. So this is what I said I would quickly go over in terms of a couple of other things, yays and nays. I'm not going to go over every single one of these because I did go over these in the previous masterclass, but I just reused the slide because it's easier and it's a good slide. But the one thing I wanted to point out in terms of not being a robot and being personable with your examiner is this one here, is these redundant lines. Maybe it's just a pet hate of mine to hear them, but I do think it still rings true when the examiner goes, okay, so what is your ethical considerations here? I don't want people being like, yeah, that's a great question. Or, oh, wow, I hadn't thought of that. Like, no, you know that you're going to be asked that and everyone else is saying that. Or, yeah, interesting scenario. You're wasting time. It's not personable. It's not interesting. It doesn't add anything. And I just, you can tell I get very passionate about this, but I personally find it very annoying. And so instead, have your own real, how do you talk to people normally? And when I talk to a friend, I don't go, yeah, interesting question. That's just not how I talk. So think about how you communicate and bring that to the table rather than having these rote, weird 
responses to a question you get asked. I know that sometimes these responses that come automatically because that's just what you've been trained to do. So don't think I'm like overly judging you if you do it, but just thinking about, I don't need to do this right now. Maybe I'll think of something else. I'm not going to go over any others on this slide. I feel like that was just my pet hate I wanted to address for today. But the other one maybe I will briefly go over is this one of overly controversial opinions. I think I already mentioned that in terms of if you obviously show no empathy or show that you're not able to reason, that's worrying. But otherwise you can share your opinion. Yeah, Eliza does say that. <laughs> but it's okay if it's genuinely what you say. But... I I don't think that everyone, when your friend asks you a genuine question of what should I do, you don't go, yeah, great question. You sit and think about what they'll do and then you give them your response. So I, unless you do that, yeah. Uh, this slide I go over again in a lot of detail in last masterclass about what to include or what sort of things to think about with each, with each kind of station. And last time we did a Y Med station and we did an Indigenous health one and then in the breakout rooms we did a problem solving one and a medical ethics. But these are the kinds of stations you can get. This is I would say it's not an exhaustive list in that there's lots of things you can fit into each one, but there's not many others that actually are different types than this. So if you're aware that these are the types you can get, this is pretty good. You can also get in things like problem solving, you might actually have to like complete a task or do a scenario. But other than that, you'll get versions of these kinds of stations. And just a bit of a general on how to practice. I get asked this a lot. And again, this is in my previous masterclass, so won't go over this in tons of detail, but taking time to actually practice well, perfect practice, making perfect right there. You can get creative. You can practice with people who are doing MMIs, practice with people who aren't doing MMIs. Most important part is after you practice, you work out what you did well, what you want to improve on so that you actually improve rather than just going, wow, that was such good MMI practice and not actually realizing that you might have done a terrible job and you need to learn from that. Or even boosting your confidence, giving yourself a pat on the back when you did do a good job. So like I mentioned, memorizing and bright learning your response. And I think maybe this is why I get it, like why I don't like the like, hmm, good question, because it just sounds so rote memorized. It just sounds so forced. But other things like, Firstly, just being aware that who knows what your scenario will be. Whilst there are those set scenario types, who knows what they'll give you on the day. But even if you do know a scenario before, markers can tell if you've wrote memorized something and you're trying to fit it in. And it also doesn't help you in the long run because you obviously can't wrote memorize your way through medical school. So instead, having a structure is fine. Knowing your structure that you've worked out and that you've sort of got down pat perfectly fine but actually memorizing content beyond you know have a few examples or personal experiences up your sleeve that's fine but actually having like an essay that you're ready to go I'm like don't do that so, so what we won't do today is I'm never going to tell you what to say so I'm not going to say oh you should have said this because it I want you to have your own opinion and there's no one right answer. So be yourself, bring yourself. I might tell you probably shouldn't have said that and that's okay. Sometimes we say things like, I wish I didn't say that, but we're not going to tell you what you should say. However, what we will do is we'll guide you on forming your own opinions and responses and tell you some things maybe to consider about a station, give you feedback and advice and help hopefully give you some good practice today as well. So today, sorry, we did four stations last time. It should be three <laughs> for today. But we're going to do one demonstration, which Liza already mentioned. I'm going to do an acting station in front of you. And then we'll send you to breakout rooms to do two other stations. And I think Liza already mentioned this part. Be prepared to volunteer in your breakout room so that you get a chance to have a go at the station. It's not scary, it's not getting recorded, it's just gonna be you and the examiner and whoever else is in the room and you might as well have a go and get some feedback and see how you tackle the station. Even if you're not having a go at it, I'd suggest going through your head what you might say so that you're like actively engaging in it. And also, if you're not doing the station, think about feedback that you'll give to the person so that you're thinking about the kinds of things that the examiner might also be looking at. Okay, so 
Karim. Hello. How's it going? Hello. Welcome. All right, we have the lovely Karim here. Yeah, so exciting. Um, So, Karim has kindly volunteered to be a student today. And uh, I figured it would be not fair to put one of you on the spot and call you out and ask you to do the station in front of everyone and for the recording. So we've got Karim. Karim is going to read the scenario and then do the station. And yes, that is all there is to it. I will be Rebecca. So give you a moment to read it, Karim, and then we'll go for it. Ready when you are. All right. Okay, yep, go. You know what to do, apparently, according to the station. Hi, Rebecca, how's your day today? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, what have you been up to? Oh, you know, just like, same old work. That's good. Yeah, that's good. Awesome. Um, Listen, Sarah, oh, sorry, listen, Rebecca, I just want to have a quick chat about something, if that's okay. Uh, I wanted yeah. To, yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, your work performance, actually. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I've just, um, I've been noticing that, you know, some of your work output um, hasn't been to the quality that, you know, you've shown in the past. Um, you know, you normally produce really great work. And I just wanted to ask if, you know, everything was okay with you. I don't get what you mean. What it, like, like what? Okay, well, I've just noticed that some of your work has been a bit lacking. Um, and it just made me a little bit concerned. I was worried, you know, that something might be going on. Are you saying I'm not good enough? No, I'm not saying you're not good enough. Um, I just know that in the past, you've always produced really great work. Um, and so when I noticed that the work quality has sort of dropped off a little bit, I got a little bit concerned. And so I wanted to flag that with you just so we can have a discussion, figure out what's going on. Oh, no, nothing, nothing's going on. Oh, I'm really fine. Yeah. Um, is there, you know, do you think there might've been anything that might've impacted the quality of your work recently? Um, I mean, I just, I'm really tired, but like everyone's tired, right? Life's busy. Yeah, I mean, life's busy, but is there, you know, if you're tired, is that something you think that might be impacting your work? I mean, maybe, like, I don't know, how would I tell? I, I don't know how to tell. Well, like, do you reckon that this tiredness has, um, made you a little bit more stressed? You know, is it every day that you feel tired? Mm, yeah, I guess I don't really notice. I just feel tired. I'm just... Yeah. Yeah. Have you spoken to anyone about that? No, because, I mean, you're the first person who's asked, so no. Okay. Um, yeah, because I've just been a bit concerned about you as all. Well. So, like, if you're tired... Um, you know, that just makes me feel a bit concerned about what what might be causing that. Um, like, you know, you mentioned that everyone gets tired and that's true, but normally it comes and goes, right? Like you shouldn't be feeling tired all the time. Mm. Yeah, I guess so. I guess, I don't know. I guess like work, working here is pretty, pretty intense, pretty stressful, I guess. So it's probably that. Um, how are you coping yeah. with that stress? I know it's, it can be a stressful environment. But how have you been coping with it? Uh, you know, I... Yeah, no, fine. I, it's fine. Listen, Rebecca, I understand if, if, you know, if you don't feel super comfortable talking to me about this. Um, I know I'm your work colleague, so it's not within my right to sort of delve into your private life and what might be happening. But I just wanted to flag this with you because you sort of not the same as what you normally are um, in terms of the quality of work that you're producing. So I just got a little bit concerned and that's that's kind of the reason why I brought this up. But, you know, if you don't want to talk to me about this, that's okay and I do understand that. But I really think you should talk to someone about it. What, what do you think? 
Yeah, I I guess I hadn't really noticed how, I don't know, how I was finding things, but I guess you're right. Like, I don't know. It, I just think everyone's probably a bit stressed, but maybe maybe I'm just, yeah, getting a bit overworked and I don't know. I just keep feeling like no matter what I do at work, it's like there's always more to do and I'm not doing a good enough job. So then it's just hard to keep getting stuff done. Yeah. Yeah, and no, I'll totally understand. And thank you for sharing that with me as well. Um, look, if you're feeling overly stressed, we need to talk about how we as a team can help you out just so we can keep producing the best quality work that we as a team have been producing before. Does that sound fair to you? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. So, yeah, I think we should definitely, you know, talk about how we can manage that um, and how we can manage your workload. But, you know, work is one thing, but your health and how you're doing in your life is far more important to us and to me, especially um, as your work colleague. So I think, you know, like I said, I'm not really the person to talk to about this, but have you considered maybe talking to your doctor about why you're feeling tired all the time? I mean, not really. I feel like you're just saying I'm not healthy now. <laughs> I think I'm pretty healthy. Yeah. Um, look, I'm not trying to imply you're not healthy. I'm sure that, you know, you are. But I think if you're feeling tired all the time, Maybe it's just something worth having a chat about. You know, we don't have to go to our doctor when we're feeling very unhealthy. We can go to them when we're not feeling great. And, you know, just to check it out, just to see if everything is okay. Um, it might not be related to health at all. Maybe it's just the stress that's causing this. I don't know. But I would love it if you did chat to someone maybe more experienced than me um, about this. And, you know, if you want us as your workplace to help you out with finding people to talk to, we'd definitely be happy to do that. Does that sound fair to you? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I get that now. Yeah. Okay. I guess I, guess I can do that. Um, I can, yeah, I can sort that out. Thanks. Thanks, Karim. Thanks for That's checking terrible. in with me. All good. Very happy to. Amazing. All right. Cool. So. How did I go? <laughs> great. What I would love. How are we going for time? Amazing. Nailing it with time. Bra well, you've got a bravo. Well done. I would love for people to put in the chat thoughts on how Karim went. Whether it's something, what he did well, or if you think he did terribly, you can put it in. I think he did pretty well. While you do that, what timing should we try to stick, stick to? One minute for reading, five minutes discussion. So every uni will have their own version of how they want to do timing. My recommendation is practice what you find hardest. So if it's you find it hardest to fit everything in a five minutes, practice that or some unis do eight minutes discussion. If you find it hard to have enough to say for that, I'd practice that more. Obviously practice all that, you're, that are relevant to where you're doing interviews. Hopefully they will tell you prior to doing it. Cause I remember mine, they like sent me, this is what your stations will be. And then you can practice what you know that you've got going on in your interviews. But if you have a few different ones that you're doing, Practice the ones that you find hardest in terms of timing. Okay. Yeah, love that. I like that he warned her about what he was going to talk about before just getting straight into it and perhaps freaking her out. Yeah, good. He definitely showed that he knew her and he, he read in the scenario that she didn't like talking about things. And so he signposted. And you should signpost anyway, but he was particularly sensitive to that. Yeah, good. I think he offered some valuable advice, tried to connect to Rebecca in a way that wasn't interrogative, but more from a place of genuine concern. Also, by the way, I'm reading out the comments because on the recording, they don't get the comments, not because I don't think you guys can't read. Um, and yes, I agree. If you have an acting station, nearly always they will have a 
dilemma or there'll be a problem or a scenario. And so you need to think about, is there advice I can give or is there support I can offer or is there somewhere I can direct them that can help them out? Great that he was respectful of her boundaries. Yeah. And you can respect someone's boundaries and still probe a little bit and still say, you know what, it's important for me and for the team or for whoever's involved to still discuss this rather than just going, okay, you don't want to talk about it, let's not talk about it. Do you think it would have been preferable to ask about Rebecca's work performance later on, say after asking more about how she is and what she's been up to? Up to you comes down to structure, right? So how you would like to structure it. So I think it depends on how she responds as well. So because she was like, wait, but my perform what do you mean my performance? Performance fine. It was like fine that he sort of brought it up because he's like, clearly she's not aware. If you want to spend a bit more time asking about her personal life to start, definitely fine too. Yeah, I really liked it was emphasized. We're worried about her health and that the work wasn't the important bit. Yeah, I agree. I really like that because it's about showing empathy, but it still was, he still stuck his ground that work was still important. It still mattered. I like the way he gave her positive feedback initially, stating that her work is normally of good quality rather than just jumping into her lack of quality. Yes, a nice compliment sandwich there. Gave a nice normalisation of going to the doctor for more general things, mental health. Yes, and I want to talk about this one a tiny bit more in a second. I definitely agree with that. I like when he used the inclusive language and said we because it helps make people think that they have people on their side and make them feel less isolated. Absolutely. He was, the language use was great. Very inclusive and very, it was gentle in some ways. Like it was very caring, but at the same time he was still firm and he was still, when she said, oh, but this is wrong or oh, no, nothing's wrong. He wasn't like, okay, cool. Nothing's wrong. Which would then turn into a very awkward station for you. If you just then sat there going, well, nothing's wrong. So that's the end of that chat. And you've still got five minutes left to go. So acting stations, they can be few and far between. The ones that I think come up the most are an emotional discussion. So dealing with something emotional, dealing with professionalism issues. So calling someone out on something or giving advice to someone about a life decision. So those are the ones that tend to come up. People get really scared about these stations, but they are literally exactly the same as other stations, but instead of saying what you do, you're actually showing your ability to do it. So if you're not confident with your ability to actually do what you say you would do, it's a little concerning. And so I think these are great stations. One of my interviews that I, so I interviewed at two unis and one of the unis I interviewed at didn't even have one and the other one did. So you might be not even get one, but just in case you do, you should practice one. In terms of a marker, <laughs> thought my mouse is going crazy there but I was looking at Sarah's not mine yes very true I really dislike when it shares the mouse on the share screen and it goes spastic so very sorry about that <laughs> in terms of me as a marker what am I looking for I'm looking for you just having a normal human conversation if I was actually genuinely your friend or whatnot that you're actually able to respond to the situation exactly like you would do can you understand can you be empathetic can you show compassion when it's appropriate so empathy is can you relate to the situation compassion is can you relate to, to the situation and feel empathy and also show that you're able that you want to help with it and that you're able to do something or fix something or show that you care enough to try and help and have the energy to try and help which he did he goes you know what let's direct you to some services or please talk to someone if you're not going to talk to me and then he took the time to discuss with her why it was important for her to see a doctor and tried to dissolve that stigma such a big tick because that is like a huge part of you wanting to be a doctor because you want to advocate for that kind of utilization and normalization of consulting with healthcare professionals. So if you can bring those in, linking people to support services, whether it's mental health support, whether it's friends and family, whatever it is, that's a huge tick. Listening is huge. I love that he listened more than he talked. It's so easy to just ramble advice and just go, Rebecca, blah, 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 you need to do this better. And like, I understand this. And this happened to me once and my cat died last week. And let me tell you about that. And I feel awful too. So easy to do. If 
they don't give you much information, ask some more questions, probe, ask them. And I gave him a hard one because Rebecca was not an open book, but instead he didn't just then go, yeah, so this is what's going on in my life. I'm really stressed too. I totally understand. This is why I'm tired. It's not about you. It's about the actor and what's going on for them. And it's a very easy trap to fall into. Will we generally be given the age of the person in the actor station? I feel like that would definitely alter the way I responded. Absolutely. You will either be given the age in the scenario or assume the age of the examiner. Obviously, you're not going to know the exact age if you have to just go by face value of the examiner. But obviously, Karim talking to me, I'm a young person rather than someone like middle-aged or older. So you can still pick that. All right. Yes, exactly. So if anyone has any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Hopefully you enjoyed watching that and got a few little tidbits out of it. The only other thing I'll say about Actor Station is it's very easy to set one up because you can literally just think about a scenario and imagine that you're doing it and then your friend can practice and vice versa. It's literally just speaking through a situation. All right, so I'm going to hand over to Lars for a second to introduce all of the lovely people who have joined us and then we'll jump into you all getting a go. Hey, awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah. You can take a sip of water because you've been talking for a straight one and a half. Um, but first of all, can everyone please thank React, clap React, not sure how to call it, um, for Karim for taking that role on being the actor today. Definitely drew the short straw in our meeting, but um, really appreciate Karim coming on and taking that on. Um, as you can see, definitely someone who just wants to um, be able to give everyone the best practice possible. So thanks so much, Karim, um, and we will see you soon. And before we head on, um, I just wanted to take the time to introduce you to um, 13 of our examiners who are here today with us. You'll be put into two breakout rooms, one after the other, with one of the um, examiners in each. So you'll get to meet two examiners. Um, and so when I um, go through your name examiners, um, they all have the uh, examiners behind their name in the Zoom right now. But if you could maybe um, clap react, uh, hands up react, not sure what to call them, um, just so that everyone can see you. Um, so the first is we have Jules, who is an MD1 at Melbourne. Um, we have Chloe, actually, I won't say who is from which uni because there's only one student who is um, a MD1 at Monash and then the rest are from Uni Melb. So it's a, it's a test for you guys to try and find out who is the Monash one. Um, so we have Jules, uh, we have Chloe, Laura Bland, not to be mistaken for the other Laura. Um, we have M Amber, we have Chris, Jack, M, Ellen, Ludi, Laura, not Laura Bland. Sanji, Daniel, and Connie. So um, you'll be able to meet them in about the 20 minutes you'll have in each breakout room. Um, and I'll hand over to Sarah to get you started with the first STEM and then the breakout rooms are already all set and you'll just get a notification to go to your first room. Amazing. So I'm just going to really briefly show you how they will logistically run and then We'll be ready to go. Thank you so much to all the examiners here to help out this morning. So what we'll do is I'll show you the scenario. I'll actually show it on the screen here. You'll get two minutes to read it. I know some places you only get one. So if you want to only give yourself one minute, you can. And then you'll go to the breakout room. You'll have eight minutes to respond. They will have follow-up questions for you. And so just like I mentioned before, you can get through as few or as many as you like. And then you'll have 10 minutes where anyone else in the room can give feedback and the examiner will also give you feedback. And that's how it will run. That's literally it. I will not be examining today, but I might end up like appearing in your breakout room and just watching for a bit. So don't be alarmed. I'll more be a fly on the wall watching. So don't worry, I'm not scary. Okay, so if we're ready to go, can we see some thumbs up? Yay, exciting. Okay, so I'm going to show you the first scenario. I'll give you two minutes to read and then Liz will put you in your breakout room. And let's go. All right. The station's on the recording. Yes, okay. Great. 
So hopefully you all found that helpful to get some, have a go at the station, get some feedback from your examiner. So we're going to do another one and we'll, if you've got questions about the stations, you can put them in at the end we'll, or just questions in general. So same deal, have a read of the station and then Eliza will put you in some breakout rooms. Terrific. Well, hopefully um, everyone enjoyed getting to do some live MMIs with your examiners in your breakout rooms. Sarah, did you want to have any general feedback for everyone? Yeah, I'll just keep it really short and sweet because I'm sure you've got heaps to think about from your examiners. So thank you so much. Could not have done it without all of the examiners coming on board today. And I think just the main thing, heard some really great structures go away, practice your structure, practice, uh, go and find some of the resources. I know a lot of the examiners shared some ideas and things to look into to help solidify your responses. But one thing about a lot of rooms, people were saying that they struggle with rambling, practice to time, practice having a structure. And if you feel like you have rambled and you're like, oh my gosh, I need to save myself. Um, uh, sort of having a conclusive statement to bring it back together or restating your contention you can feel like okay I've I've stated my main point I'm back on track so that's a big one if you let's say with the Joe pizza one for example if you'd rambled for a few minutes or whatnot then afterwards you can go okay this is what I think and wrap it all up I'll just leave it at that. If you have any more specific questions about it, or if you have any questions in general, you're more than welcome to email me. I'll put my email in the chat for you. As you guys go through writing your reflections into the chat and sharing that with everyone, um, one thing I did want to go through was just like, what is, what else can you get if you want to um, get, get more MMI prep? And in particular, I just wanted to talk about three specific things. Um, and I'm just gonna pop that in the chat uh, as well. So first off, I just wanted to show you um, our podcast that we actually made for our MMI students. And it's essentially completely free on all Apple Music, Spotify, and YouTube. It's this uh, Making of an MD podcast. Season one was all about resources to help you get um, exposed to some things that might come up in the MMI and you don't want to be like shocked and hearing it for the first time in an MMI situation. So you can hear more about that. Um, we basically get an MD student or a doctor to actually come on and talk about that topic specifically. So it could be things like the link between climate change and um, health or food systems and health and that kind of thing. Um, and then in season two, which we just launched, we're actually launching episodes which are complete stations. Um, so you get to hear a live behind the scenes of a student trying to attempt a station and then our examiner giving full feedback there. So it's tune into that podcast. The second thing is if you have not yet, like our Australian um, Hell to Health Facebook page, because that's where we sort of put up all of our free resources and you'll be able to see it firsthand there so you don't miss a thing. Um, and last, if you have not already, to roll and in, enroll into our mock MMI rounds, which are eight stations. It's two hours of live MMI, and then you get a bit of a break, and then you have one and a half hours of a cohort um, review, where essentially you can see how you performed in the cohort, um, and that's fully refundable because sometimes um, we don't know who is going to get offers where, um, but there is a GEMSAS and a Monash type MMI that you can enroll into. Um, and for now, I think until Sunday night, there is an early bird offer right now where you could um, get, what is it? A uh, 30 minute free one-on-one -on -one diagnostic station. So essentially um, to help give you just an experience like today, but personalized to you on a real station to work with. Um, and you'll be able to get that advice and feedback to be able to implement when you actually go into your mock MMI round and be able to make the most out of that. Um, otherwise, thank you so, so much everyone for joining. We hope to see you so soon um, and good luck with your preparation and we wish you all the very best.